So welcome everybody. This is uh, uh, session two of the four presentations that Dr. Michael Bale is doing for us on the Lean Leadership Development Model. This is on coaching and developing others. So uh, Dr. Bale, thank you very much. For everybody else, if you have questions, please chat them to Tom Lawless, Peter DePorter, and Rafael Lucero. So those three individuals will take your chats, read them, stop our presentation, or not stop it, but interrupt at the right time, and ask the question, and then go back on mute. So I think, Michael, if you're ready, I think we're ready to go when, whenever you want. Go ahead. Well, thank you, George. Th thanks for inviting me again. Um, I think that coaching develop others is uh, probably one of the of the greatest uh, contributions that Jeff made and really, really enlightened me in many things. And I'll try to talk you through this as, as I go. Um, uh, as I mentioned the last time, I've been um, studying Lean for 20 years. And, and it's really amazing to see to what extent we continually revisit it and we continue to wonder about what we got right and what we got wrong. And this is this is why, as I said uh, last time, um, I think Toyota is still important in the lean movement, and because it, it has continued to grow and evolve as well as well as lean. So so somewhere there's a conversation with Toyota, which which is how I what what I I see as lean. What I call lean is this: uh, how do we understand what Toyota did uh, 30 or 40 years ago what is doing now? And how does this, how is this relevant outside of Toyota in, in other industries and other companies? Uh, to, to me, the Toyota's biggest, most striking lesson was, was the fact that to make products, we first must make people. Is that is this for? Um, I plead guilty. I, I wrote um, my first book was on system thinking. My second book was on process reengineering. Uh, I'm French, so I really thought that if you organize things right, uh, you can just stuff people in there and they'll do as they're told, and this will come up with the right outcome. And this revolution that Toyota brings that, that this is not the case, uh, it has to be people-centric. Um, quality is something that needs human judgment. Uh, I think it is such a profound um, a lesson in, in our century of uh, complete obsession with standardized processes. And, and again, I'll plead guilty because I, I did write a book on process reengineering. So this is, this is, this was such a fresh departure from all this. And, and it, it led us to reinterpret many of the thoughts where were correct. So let's go back to the basics. When, uh, when uh, Kyushu or Toyota um, imagined what just in time could be like, he defined it, and this is straight out of the Toyota's website. He decided he was looking for the ideal conditions for making things that are created when machines, facilities, and people work together to add value without generating any waste. Uh, this is a this is what we aim for, and what we are talking here is is working together. This is not like a process that we imagined as a sequence of steps. This is a collaborative effort to better work together so we can add more value without generating so much waste. And the other very mystifying thing that Taishi Ono once said was, uh, he wrote in, I think he's quoted in, uh, in, in other books in this case, you know, but th there is a secret to the shop floor, just as there is a secret to magic trick. Let me tell you what it is. To get rid of waste, you have to cultivate the ability to see waste. And you have to think about how to get rid of the waste you've seen. You must repeat this always everywhere, tirelessly and relentlessly. Now, this is this is really fundamental. These two quotes are very interesting to put close to each other because um, the old timers might remember a time where lean was all about the seven waste, seven waste this and seven waste that. And, and you say, okay, but how did this, the fact that you're watching an operator walk a few feet or a forklift move a few crates uh, matter to the whole picture? And I think this is the unique thing about the Slim Vision, is that the way you teach people, the way you develop their understanding of what they do, is by looking at the detailed waste in the cycle and trying to understand what is the large scale waste that created this condition. So we have these two quotes that I think are essential to understand what we're trying to do with Lean. 
And, and this is where uh, Jeff's contribution is, is so so striking, so important, is to, to, to look at this whole cycle that we're going through, which is uh, the, the first, of course, it, it rests on the, the leader's commitment to self-development because the company is a mirror, a deforming mirror, but a mirror of, of what the leader thinks and the choices the leader that she makes. And, and the second part is how to coach and develop others. So this idea that you don't just decide and then execute. The, the, you go through people. It's not through organization or process or reorganization that anything you want to get done, you have to go through people. You, you have to teach them. So here's a question. Here's a question. All of us are in charge of a number of people or are leaders in our fields or have people around us, and here's the fundamental question is, is, do we use the few brains around us, the five or six people we talk to every day, and then lots of pairs of hands, or do we actually use every brain in the organization? It's a very simple question, but I think that this is the question that makes or breaks it. That, that, that Henry Ford is, uh, it's rumored, or his, his apocryphal probably said that the problem with that, that every time he hired a, a pair of hands, um, there was a brain that came attached to it. Well, here we're turning this around and say, well, the brilliant thing is that um, we have so many brains in the company. The real question is, how do we create companies that actually use all the potential from all this intelligence in, in terms of creating value for customers without generating so much waste? Can I ask you a question on that last slide? Sure. Okay, so I, I, I was talking uh, and uh, Dr. Mark Jabin was talking about how the brain slows, same with Jeff Liker, he was talking about how the brain slows down when we're using our prefrontal cortex, because we, we got to think, when we think slow, it takes up a lot of energy. So in, in some companies, don't you really want to use their hands? I mean, have you had that question come? Don't you want their hands? Don't you want them to meet the standard? You don't want them to think too much? Because they'll slow the process down. How do you how do you answer that? Oh, I I remember um, I, I remember an old time supervisor who was an ex army guy who said once said to me, you know, if people want to, the, the moment they start thinking, they start disobeying. Um, I, I think this is exactly the mentality, and I'll, this is what I'll go through in this presentation. This is what we we need to change in ourselves, and I think this is part of the previous question of uh, self development: is is how do we recognize that we have uh, been we grew up with this notion that if you you've got the organization right and you fix the organization, then people should could stop having to think; they just have to follow the rules, and then everything will be great. And and I think this is uh, to a unique contribution is to realize that we tend to think that the process is okay. It was defined by a smart engineer. Just follow the process and everything will be fine. And of course, it never is. There's, there's every day is full of friction of things that don't work out of unexpected circumstances. So I think Toyota is a brilliant contribution to, to management was to say no process is ever perfect, ever. People are not the problem. People are the solution to improve the process again and again. And this is a very um, this is a very radical shift. And it, it, like I said last time, lean is not for everybody. Lean is not for everybody. Lean is for people who are serious about working well, working better, and becoming more competitive. And this means that you have challenge to challenge some of your assumptions. I think, I think this is going to be easier, I think, if, if I go through a story and tell you the story of, of, of a, a CEO that made this change. Now, here's a company. This is this is a company created by an absolute brilliant guy. I mean, once upon a time, is, is 20 years ago now, he, he started this company. Uh, it was a, a, a few watchmakers who wanted to explore new technology to make some parts. It's a, it's a metal injection molding technology. So rather than cut the part out of the metal, you blend metal powder with uh, plastic, you inject it, and then you get the, you bake it so your plastic goes away and then you get a perfect part, a metal part with a with an additive process rather than an extractive process. So, so it's a fascinating technology. And they wanted to make a watch parts on them, so they, 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 they took this guy who's brilliant, he's a genius guy, he's got the brain size of a planet, 
and they, they said, let's start this company as a startup. And like many startups, this company was looking for, for really great products because the, the doing watch parts was not getting the growth they wanted. And they hit upon the, the, you know, the mother load, the, the brilliant product. They, they, you see these, um, these luxury phones here, that they're very, very expensive phones. And this technology was perfect to make the, uh, the, the, the keypad, to make the keypad. And this is what happened to them. This is every startup dream. Um, the startup started in 1995, and suddenly around the, the year 2000, they hit this keypad business that kept booming and booming and booming. So here they, they're completely into the scale of problem. This is a startup dream. Finally, they, they've, they've got it, they've got it made. And we're uh, kind of a gallows humor laughing about this because we found a, a strategic plan with, with this guy um, of 2006 that, were, that they were imagining with the next 10 years and their only problem at the time was scale up and they couldn't deliver. They couldn't produce- so Explain, this, couldn't explain this chart, what's the green line, total CA? Sorry? The, oh, sorry, the, uh, this is the sales, the sales, the green line is sales. So you can see the sales are booming and you can see the results, the profitability is booming. And they have one problem, they have all this demand for these key, key part, keyboards and they can't deliver. So, so he starts, he gets into lean just to fix one very simple problem, which is delivering. Uh, in 2007, there's this, uh, this chap in California that comes up with this weird gadget that is going to transform our lives. It's, it's an iPhone. And the year, the next year, then uh, Lehman, there's a Lehman Brothers collapse and we get into the Great Recession. So imagine what these two events did to the beautiful 2006 strategic plan of the company. This is what happened. Uh, basically, the demand for actual physical keypads and keyboards for the phones just disappeared, and the demand for all other businesses disappeared with the Lehman Brothers and meltdown. So we we're really talking about a, a burning platform. So the question mark is, is this the end of the company? And this is, I remember we were discussing this at the time, and it was very, very close. It was really, really scary times. So they had to innovate, really. They, they, they just said, okay, forget it. We're gonna go and take every part we can and they use the technology to go into medical, to go into luxury designer items, to go into aeronautics, every single part they could. And, and, and because these guys are very, very smart, um, they actually, as you can see, save the company. And they, they, this is not an easy thing to do. What, what you see in this uh, less spectacular, but far more impressive curve is whereas the first growth was built on one single product, a huge volume for a very small company. The, the second curve is a far healthier, is built on a, a range of different products come, coming from constant innovation. This is a complete game changer. Now, the problem that um, the CEO had, of course, is that it's very, very, very hard to do this just on yourself. So like, before he just had one product and he had all these hands to execute. And now he's, he's generating dozens of products a year so he can no longer just design them all and have to execute. He needs all the brains. And this brings us to this, this radical reinterpretation of lean here, which is what uh, Akio Toyota says in, in the preface to Toyota Way to Lean Leadership, Jeff's book. He says that the objective are reached by developing people. We said to Toyota that every leader is a teacher developing the next generation of leaders. This is their most important job. Now, with, like, with many of these Toyota things, we, we tend to dismiss them as Toyota folklore, uh, culture, Japanese, whatever. But, but I found that we always get it wrong. You know, some things we think our deep principles are our misunderstandings, and some things we think are are actually the deep things Toyota is teaching us. Can you give me one example, Michael, of, of that scenario for you, of of how how we take the principles and we think it's you know, you know all, all the time, all the time. Um, an engineer, a good engineer should wash his hand three times a day. Sounds like folklore, yes? It sounds like, you know, Japanese sword making that when the frog croaks three times in the moonlight, then you put the, you put the sword back into the water to, to, for the process, you know? Well, actually, no, this is actually very deep. This means that engineers should not be designers on the screen. 
but should be guys who actually go and touch the parts in the in, in the shop floor to understand the process of building the parts with the manufacturing engineering, not just the product engineering, and that they should get their hands dirty because this is where they get the facts and not the data on the screen. So here we have an example of something that sounds like folklore, but is actually the very deep lesson. Whereas uh, the whole notion that you should front load the process, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying that it's uh, in practice is not so simple. And certainly from what I've heard uh, from people telling me at Toyota, um, it's not such a deliberate thing they do. It's a consequence of other things. So, so it's very hard from the outside to, I'm not saying that it's untrue. I'm saying that it's, do you see what I mean? It's hard to distinguish what is what. So you always have to be careful because some of the Toyota, uh, Toyota-ish, if you're seeing folklore, is actually very full of deep lessons. So um, talking about which, uh, we, uh, you know, Freddie and I couldn't resist the temptation to actually put it in the model to try to explain this uh, developing people. Um, and uh, for all faults, uh, for all sins, uh, certainly I, I doubt that any self-respecting Toyota veteran would, uh, would uh, agree with this. But again, we, we, we're trying to communicate this thing, so this is the best we could come up with. The, the heart of this is that uh, both resu results and the relationships matter. You cannot have, you need a good relationship to have improvement because the, the, the cultural core of lean is problems first. And in order to face problems, you have to have a solid relationship. And it, it, I, I, I live through this every day that sometimes um, even very solid relationships when you're confronted to a real personal problem that when you have a dog in the fight, the relationship has to be really solid to withstand the fact that we're looking at the problem and not, not we're looking at the why, not the who, and we need to get together to fix the problem. And this, this goes very deeply because we're, sometimes we find people we dis disagree with, and the temptation is to treat them as enemies, as opposed to embrace them and say, guys, it's precisely because we disagree that we're going to find something new. So th this is the core insight, the, the, the change your life insight is that to get results, we don't get them from pressure. We don't get them by, you know, forcing people to do things. We get them by building the relationship. And, and the whole model is what kind of practices uh, we can have to build these relationships. The first is again, she can go to the first is to go and see for yourself. You look with, with this is a Oh no, uh, quote or misquote, but uh, you look you look with your feet and you think with your hands and you, you, you go and see for yourself. And I cannot stress how important it is back to this, wash your hands three times a day. Um, uh, I'll, go, I'll talk about this some more in the next seminar on Kaizen. I cannot stress how important this is. So the, the reason you go and see for yourself is, is really to experience the fast, facts firsthand. And in fact, it's something that it's, it's an event that you share with the people. And I, every single time I, I've been doing this for, for studying lean for 20 years and I've been taught by my father for, for more than 10. And, and every time we're on the meeting room and people go on about some issue and you say, okay, let's go and have a look. The moment you go to the game, there is a problem, but it's not at all the way. So what you find here in the company is that you, you, you see that they really look at the parts, the, the parts in detail, and they systematically, and they forget the discussions in the room, and they go systematically and try to see what really is going on. And if nothing else, this is probably the most important practice. Can, can, can we talk a little bit about that slide? Now, when this is so important, but you, you know what I see, and I'll tell you, um, and it's a little upsetting, <laughs> uh, what I see is a lot of uh, executives saying, I trust my people. They need to go fix the problem. I want the results. I don't care to go see for myself. You know, how do you, how do you handle that? I mean, isn't that just a complete, I don't know, disjointed, right. disjointed this is process? Very, this, is, this is a very interesting one because, because again, um, um, I'll, 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 I'll go through this in the next slides. Basically, uh, lean practice is very different from managing by walking about. Uh, the people who say this are not are not incorrect. They, they have a very valid point. Is that if you're a senior exec and you just go on the shop floor, you can you you bring with yourself a lot of stress as well. And it's a well-known psychological fact uh, that the worst time of people's day 
is the time they spend with their boss. So you have to be really careful with that and not, and not impose too much of, the, of your time on them because that really stresses them out. So let, let, let's, let's talk through the slides and see what we're doing on the shelf floor. The first thing we're doing is this dimension of challenge. Now, uh, the, the important thing to have is that the executive in, in the lean situation and back to the self-development, they have some long-term issues in mind that are always going to be the same. I mean, you need to improve your quality, you need to improve your delivery, you need to improve your variety, you need to improve your flexibility. This doesn't really change much from one year to the next. What, what changes is the conditions in which this happens. So here you have it. The first thing we were looking for here is how do we link the customer smile, customer preferences, with what is okay and not okay in the production process. This is a very deep understanding. And what you see in the company here, it's, the slide is a bit too small, but they, they do radar charts to capture customer preferences. This is final customer preferences as they understand it. Um, their own customer, which is usually, usually the assembler as they understand it. And they, 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 you see the engineers and you teach the engineers to learn to link the preferences through the chain to the, the actual process that they do, the production process. And this is a very, very fair skill. It's a very tough skill and you need to go back to it uh, all the time. So what, what, the people in the, the, the um, you have here five of the product, uh, product managers of the, of the company and the, the CEO uh, really try to, to get them to understand that the feel of a luxury project, uh, product is very different from the feel of a uh, aeronautics product, product because uh, their customers have such different lifestyles and expectations and so forth. And as a small company, it, it's very hard. When, when you are working for only one client and one product, you kind of absorb naturally the client's values. But when you start diversifying, then it becomes very complicated because each different client has different values and you need to discover this. So here's the very first skill of challenging is do we always challenge, always challenge, do we get the customer's lifestyle preferences right? And how are these reflected in our process? The, the second dimension of challenge is that we give dynamic objectives, not stable. When, when you see these, these indicative graphs in, in shop floors around the world, most of the time we have a straight bar for it. It's a horizontal line and people are supposed to achieve this level and they do or they don't. And here we're challenging, this is lean. What we want is dynamic progress, not static efficiencies. So the idea is that we say like, for instance, in two years, we want to reduce uh, here missed deliveries by 50% and we draw the line. And we don't particularly blame people if they don't get it, that's all the point. But we, get, we give them some way to actually visualize the challenge in a day-to-day, -day, um, you know, progressive uh, challenge. Now, of course, when you do this as a you're on the you're you're the leader, you're the CEO, you're on the shop floor, you challenge people on their understanding of what they're doing. Um, this this is uh, interesting to them, but it's also also a, a bit stressful. I mean, a bit, it creates some tension. So you have to balance this yin yang thing, this challenge, by listening. And listening, and I mean listening until it hurts. And what listening means is that people will find a lot of barriers in their mind for why this is not possible, or this can't be done, or this is unrealistic. And sometimes you, because you have a bit different perspective, you think, ah, oh, come on, it can't be that hard, you know? But actually it is. If it's, it's a barrier, even if it's in their minds, it's a barrier. And this is, listening is really about how do we hear what people say? So again, we develop people, and the first thing we teach in is, is we teach people to plan their day, and this is a, pro, um, a production analysis board that's a basic key uh, lean tool, and they, they know roughly what they have to do in the day, and, and they themselves, you see, draw the plan, hourly plan, this is the number of the part they do and how many parts they should do, actually. and they themselves uh, write what they've achieved against the plan, and most importantly, they ride the obstacles they've encountered. Now, this is this is fundamental because if, if you go to somebody face to face on the, on the shop floor, and you say, "What are the obstacles you encountered?" You're just stressing them out. So don't do that. 
we create a visual tool so we can communicate. And, and already in Taishi Ono, you can see it, and Taishi Ono understood the difference between, he understood, of course he did, but he, he explained the difference between managing by walking about and lean practice, which is that if you don't have visual tools, managing by walking around as a senior person, you're just creating a lot of a mess. You're stressing everybody. You don't know what you're talking about. So these visual tools are there to teach people how to actually actually ride the obstacles as they, as they encounter them. And we're not asking them to solve them all, not at all. We're just creating an environment where we understand what stops us hour by hour, the detailed things, the grains of sand that create friction so we don't get the result we, we thought we would have. Then, uh, then the second thing you do to listen, uh, you teach them to express a problem, look for the cause and confirm the counterfeiter. You spend time, um, you're not solving problems for them, but you're asking yourself, okay guys, have you expressed the problem well? Is this really the cause? Can you confirm that your countermeasure worked? And and this is where you listen. You, 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 you just let them talk and you listen to what, and you ask yourself all the time, why are they thinking this? What did I do as a CEO to create an environment where if I disagree, where they would be thinking this? What, what, is, what listening really means is what is the, the, the universe in this person's mind in which what they say makes perfect sense when it doesn't to me? And, and this, is, this is what the CEO does, is spend a lot of time listening to how people understand their problems. I'd like to know uh, how many CEOs are like that. <laughs> well, again, those, um, um, I don't know, it's those who commit to lean, it's part of the lean method. So those who commit to lean, uh, actually you learn this because that is the lean method kind of thing. Yeah, um, it's, it's, so here you see the CEO listening to one of his engineers and, uh, and again, you listen to the obstacles people encounter and you don't dismiss them. You don't, you know, talk them down. You don't say, I expect a miracle and say, no, well, we, we take the encounters seriously, the obstacles seriously. I mean, if you encounter the obstacle, uh, let's, let's hear this. And again, um, understanding doesn't mean agreeing. I, I, maybe I don't agree it's an obstacle, but I understand you're having one. So let's, let's talk through this. And of course, would you recommend the uh, House of Quality as a way to help engineers understand customer requirements? Yes. Qualified, yes. I would recommend Genshi Gimbutsu. I would recommend watching what the customer really does with the product. How the customer, how does the customer use the product in their lifestyles and to experience it firsthand. And we're back to this first slide, go and see. House of quality is a, uh, I use it, I use it. Uh, I don't use it very often, but it's a tool to get everybody to agree on what kind of architecture we're looking at. So, so it's a more detailed engineering tool. And yeah, I do recommend it, but I think that it, it's very easy to miss the point. I've seen so many people do the house of quality in a meeting room. So to understand customer preferences, you need to be out there with customers as they use a product. And, and you always discover that what there's two things happen. First, people want holes, not, not drills. Two, people like buying drills. It's a complex world out there. So customers usually have a functionality they want to do, and they also have likes and dislikes about the product according to when they use it. So there's absolutely no way you can capture this in just a, a drawing. You need to live it with them to get a feel for their pain and their likes and dislikes. And, and you, 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 I like the Toyota phrase that you, you try to earn the customer's smile. But you also look at all the time when the customer is just frowning, but there, because there's something that you've never thought of that in their lifestyle, your product is causing a problem. Then you put it together. You put it put it on the wall on the on the brown paper as a as a as a house of quality uh, to get everybody to agree that we did see the same thing. But that's a second order thing. Does that, does that answer? Does that answer the question? I believe so. The 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 second thing here now we, we if we go back to we're on the shop floor, we're developing people by challenging them. But however, 
However, let's face it, giving people an objective without giving them a system to get there is just cruel. And this is what so many executives do. I don't care how you do it, just bring me the results. Well, that's not very nice, you know? Come on, if, if they knew how to do it, they have done it before. I mean, they're, 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 that's why they're here to work. So the second part of this thing is, once we've challenged people, and we do, when we listen to the obstacles, we hear the obstacles, then we have to help them with ways to overcome these obstacles. And they say, we need to teach, and we need to teach two things, how to work, work skills, and how to improve improvement skills. So here, here's in this company, the, one of the very first practices we started, which we called Dojo. But Dojo is a plan where we said the first responsibility of every supervisor is to personally train one-on-one -on -one all their operators. So what you see here is uh, the, you have on the, on, on the, on the left of the board, you have all the operators in, one, one, in a couple of teams under one supervisor. You have the days. And every day, the supervisor spends 20 minutes on one person. The next day, the next, the next day, the next. And they go into standards and they check standards together. And when the standard is not written, they write the standard together. So next time you come to it. And, but basically, we make sure that every frontline manager spends 20% of their day talking to one person into the details of the work. And we teach the work. This is really. Um, I can't stress how important this is. And again, um, I, I have to um, give credit to, to Jeff, who, who really opened my eyes with, uh, I remember reading the, the, the proof of the French translation of uh, Toyota Talent and, and realizing that uh, I had been so focused on the Kaizen that I had completely missed this part, which is the standards. And yes, you cannot have Kaizen without standards. Now, the trick with the dojo is that in many companies, there are no standards or the standards are not written. So people say, how can we start the Kaizen if we don't have started where You just start training. You have a training plan. And if you don't have a standard, the first step you do is you write a standard. And then you come back to it. And then you say, well, but how can we Kaizen the standard and how can we prove it? So the, it's, it's the interaction between the supervisor and the operator that matters. And the standardized work or the, actually just the standard and the Kaizen is just a way to have this interaction. So this is a very important practice. Then the second thing is, of course, you uh, teach PDCA-based Kaizen in various forms. So you have a different forms. You have actually uh, suggestions, Kaizen workshops when you're dealing with cross-functional issues, A3s when you're dealing with middle management. And this is this is a, and, and here this is really an important thing. You're not trying to solve all problems with the illusion that one day your process will be perfect because it will have no problems at all. You're using problems, just like in medicine, as a basis for teaching people to understand better what they do and to go deeper into the, 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 the physics of their job. <coughs> and all of this hangs together, of course, with the architecture of the pool system. Here you have um, a supervisor and the person who's in charge of, of, picking, of, of running the small train, and the, they look at the leveling board, and this is uh, really what, what the, the discipline of the pool is what creates a tension that will reveal the problems and tell you where, where you should go. It's, this is the, the, what this slide is really telling you is a story. Do you guys know the story of um, the French executive and the American and the Japanese guys uh, building a, um, a, a factory in, uh, somewhere in the South American mountains and they get taken hostage by the guerrillas, say that they're against capitalism, so they're going to shoot them. That's setting everybody up. You got to tell us now. <laughs> but okay, did you know that? Did I tell you the story already? I can't remember, but I think somebody dies. No. <laughs> yeah, well, basically, no, yeah, they said, we're going to shoot you, uh, but we believe in free speech, so you can say something. So the French guy comes first and says "Vive la France," and then they shoot him. And the Japanese guy comes up and says, "I'd like to talk to you about the lake and the rocks." And the, the American guy jumps up in front of the Japanese guy and says, if I'm going to hear one more time about the Lake of the Rocks, please shoot me first. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is really the core of it. This is, this is what you're seeing on this slide is the Lake and the Rocks. We take off Kanban cards, we accelerate the flow, and this is what reveals where the problems are, it reveals where, where all, all the flow is not flowing. And this is what gives you the tension 
to create the pulse to create the, the problems. This tool um, at all, Michael, if, if you're intimate with it, I, I'd be curious to ask a couple questions. Example, I think the blue line represents where today is. Anything to the left is we're late. Is that is that the scenario? Um, yeah, in this in this case, um, what you have is a blue line represent where we are. You're, you have the, the the line of cards is what we need to pick up in the future today. We're, we're looking at here, at, uh, we, we do a 15 minute pickup and you see there's a few, if you see the pointer here, I don't know if you see it, there, there's a few cards left um, on the left of the blue line, which are the cards that we couldn't pick up for whatever reason. So this, when you see the lines, these block of line, they represent a cell, which in the factory will be represented by a shop stock. So this tells you where you're going to pick up the cards in the factory. It, it's a lending board, yeah? Yeah, very good, thank you. But what is important is this really is the architecture for progress. Now, so you've you, you're doing the challenging part, you're listening to obstacles, you're teaching people, and, but then uh, reality fights back. You know, um, there's a, there, you're in the fog of war, lots of things are happening. You get a lot of friction. Some simple things actually are difficult to do. They resist. So you need to hold people's hands and you need to support them and to develop them. And, and so we're getting to the other part. This is, is you, you, you need to understand that you, you're growing trees here. You're not building bridges. So you, you need to start small and grow people. And here is uh, Jeff's uh, model of T development, saying you, you develop people in two dimensions. One is, of course, deepening the technical dimension, and this is so important, and so many companies have made such terrible mistakes by dismissing it. But this is really uh, somebody should, before, before anything else, be really good at what they do. So you're constantly improving the core competency. But the other dimension, and this is really interesting, is leadership. And in Toyota uh, vocabulary, this is teamwork. Teamwork is not being part of the team. Teamwork is the individual ability to work with people beyond boundaries. Teamwork, it's the leadership of knowing how to work with upstream and downstream colleagues, which is it breaks down the silo. It's not the, the process that breaks down the silos. It's actually knowing to work with your colleagues, even when it's difficult. And, and what you have on the left of the screen is how do you do this? Is, as we said, well, you visualize activities, you formulate problems, you seek the root cause, you study the countermeasure, and you go round and round and round this cycle. Um, you have a flip chart to make sure that people write it so you can discuss it with them. And uh, as, as you do, you, you always think, am I developing the technical excellence and am I, am I developing their leadership ability? Um, this is, this is a Jess model, and I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful tool. And of course, the way you do it is try and see, try and see all the time. So here, you see on this slide, for instance, you have the, the old way the stations were done, and now they're experimented with uh, gravitics and a new way to move things around. Um, they, 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 this is another company, I, I may, maybe another time I'll talk to you about, about that does the, these, these assemblages. And the operators uh, do the Kaizen on it and, and experiment with them. And the only way, and you have to move people to action. When you have an idea, just try it and see how it does and correct it and see how it does. And you need to support this. You need to give permission. You need to say to people, hey, go ahead, try it. Now, again, as I was saying, that the, the, you see the CEO here uh, on the right of the slide, he, he mostly listened, listened, looks at the 83s, listened to what they say, and he's had in his mind, it's like, do they understand the issue technically well enough? And do they know well enough to work with people across the boundaries? And of course, as you do this, you have to accept that people run into personal difficulties. They will do, and, and they're your patient, and you need to help them through. Um, there's absolutely no way to pressure somebody when they run into trouble. Sometimes it's something at home. Sometimes it's life. Uh, sometimes it's something at work. Sometimes it's just some intellectual difficulty they have with the job. And uh, forcing them to go faster is not, just not going to help. So this is part of supporting. This. You actually, when you support people, you support people. You know, you 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 help them through. And this is part of the uh, of the lean model of the lean ideal that it's not just physical safety, but it's also security uh, for people to feel that they can, um, um, you know, in, um, in in Eric Schmidt's terms about uh, 
working at Google, you know, you, you can uh, you can fly the fighter pilot uh, super fast and you can crash it because you've got lots of coins in your pocket and you just put another coin in the machine and start again. So you're both working very hard and you are safe because you know that if you crash, no problem. You have another coin in your pocket and you can start the machine again. Which brings us to something that we discovered in this particular company, which is the teamwork, the so collaboration. And and um, when you when you do so much Kaizen and you do so much problem solving, at some point you wonder what makes the difference between a, a good problem solving, bad problem solving. Uh, some problem solving are fake problem solving. People just write stuff and they're not really thinking. Sometimes problem solving is brilliant and you see ideas you've never seen before. And we realize that the difference is teamwork, is the intensity of the collaboration between people. So uh, again, this is uh, back to going to the, why do you go to the Gamba? You go to the Gamba to make people agree on the problem and then build on each other's ideas instead of dismiss or destroy them. And then this word, try storm, try and see, try and see. Together, you try stuff quickly. And it's interesting in this company because they um, they uh, they got a 3D printer, they created a fab lab, and it, it accelerated so much the, the, the speed at which they could try things and then think differently about it. And to bring all this together, you create what's called an obeya. Here you have the production one, there's another one in engineering in which you put on the wall, you know, the indicators and then the key PDCAs people are working on. So that everybody understands what everybody is doing without having to do these, these soul destroying meetings and what everybody says, I'm doing this and that and, and nobody cares. Here we, we put it all on the board, everybody can read, we can see what we're doing. And we present one at a time when we're doing and everybody else listens and it's a very short presentation and it rotates around people. So everybody's got a pretty good idea what we're working on. And there are no surprises in terms of uh, what kind of new things are coming in the pipeline. Now, this is one of the most amazing things for me as a sociologist. It took me a long time to see it. Back to going to the Gemba. You go to the Gemba because when they learn, you learn. You go to the game and you give people challenges. Say, please, can you improve in that direction? You don't have a destination in mind, but you want better quality or better just in time. And this translates through the visual control into very specific problems. They solve the problem, and sometimes you look at it and you learn something you didn't expect, which goes way beyond beyond the local solution. So this is this is yeah, same company. Our aim is that everyone in the company partakes in the joy of creation. They, that they get this feeling that they contributed to the company. And what you see here is, is uh, an idea that comes from uh, the old Toyota plant in Brazil. The, what is painted in green in the cell is uh, operators' guys. All these are operators' ideas that they make modifications on the cell. And we paint them in green to show that they, this is what the operators do. And, and look at the smiles, if this is what you aim. You aim for the customer smile and you aim for the people smile. And this is, this is our ideal, this is what we, the, what, what we live for. So this brings us to the big, big thing where we need to change our mind. Well, I don't know about you guys, but certainly I had to change my mind considering how I was educated in, in management, which is that you don't train people to problem solving so that they all take out all the problems and one day you're going to have the perfect process which you can then standardize and cookie cutter apply everywhere. This is what we all were brought up to. It's completely the other way around. You use process improvement techniques to develop people's expertise, what we call lean standards, and judgment, their discernment, so that they better interpret everyday processes and invent new ones. Processes are all about not the tasks, but the choice, the discernment, the understanding of doing it right, doing it what it means, the detail to do it well. And this is what we need to develop in people. So we, 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 we have to abandon this idea that if we pressure people in solving problems faster, we'll get to the perfect process faster. This is just ridiculous. Something else will happen. We know that. It's as ridiculous as the strategic plan in 2006, and look what happened the next year. No, we teach people to develop their ability to change and to understand what goes on and deal with different things and build new things, 
new processes, new ideas. And the, they, we teach people to really master their standards so that when a new thing or new conditions come along, they know how to deal with this in confidence. And to me, this is the core of the lean message. And this is a truly revolution message. And again, this is something that, that Jeff so, so clearly and taught us all that it was there in Toyota from the start, but we were so obsessed with our idea of standard processes that we thought we could take uh, Toyota processes and just cookie cutter and standardize them and copy them anywhere. And it has failed for so many years. It has never worked, never. You grow people and the people themselves grow the processes. So uh, where does this come from? Well, this comes from, this is basic psychology. This comes from the creative tension there is between what you aim for and what you actually do. And this creative intention, would you just support it by asking why and why and why? And this is what gives a chitin. As a manager, you need to fuel this all the time by coming, creating this, uh, this tension, and you do this through visual control. Visual control, all these visual bits you've seen in the slides, all these elements, are about translating your uh, long-term business challenges into very specific challenges on the shop floor that people can understand as they work. So if you have good visual control as you work, you can lift your eyes and understand that you're back uh, five parts in the production analysis boards uh, because, you, the, the, because you had a defective component. And here you have your built-in quality uh, management challenge translated in a very specific thing in the hour. Usually visual control will reveal uh, that you have to improve individual skills so you train people, and that you have improved your test methods like the Pokeyoki and all these things. And the, the result of this cycle is that you get better processes. We tend to, uh, Western companies tend to interpret it the other way around, which is they start by uh, some engineer thinks of a better mousetrap, a better process, improve the process, that then you know, teach the people to do the improved process and then control it in some manner. And they're always disappointed because the cycle definitely works this way. So this is the visual control. The other part is the Kaizen and every team should have some Kaizen elements. And here, uh, this is, uh, I've been told this Kaizen uh, approach by, uh, my, by another one of my senses, who is uh, Art Smolley, who spent many years working in Toyota. And he's, he's written this wonderful book, which is called uh, Toyota Kaizen, with uh, one of the original, one of the guys who formulated the Kaizen method in Toyota called Zao Kato. And basically what we have here is a slide showing, on the one hand, the, the Kaizen steps, uh, starting from the challenge, to analyze the current method, to come up with new ideas, to plan how to make them happen, to try and see, to evaluate the new method and to draw conclusions. But what I think is important to have in mind uh, for lean managers and, and for, for, for managers who wanted to, to get lean is that every one of these steps is not about fixing the process. It's about de developing specific competences. The, the challenge part is you develop the problem awareness. Then you analyze the current method is to develop the knowledge of standards. Then to come up with new ideas is to be inventive then to plan how to make it happen is to understand how you work with the organization. Then, of course, you have to be able to do stuff and to discern where it works and where it doesn't work and to see what are the wider implications. So really, you, you can break down here how the Kaizen is about developing people's competence. And, and this is my conclusion. Again, uh, we talk about the systems, a lean system, and, and what is a system? Well, there's two parts of this. One is the execution system, you know, what we all live with, which is getting things done. And what Lean is really is a learning system. And of course, uh, you see that if you're um, an employee, most of the time you spend most of them executing, and you do a little bit of Kaizen and problem solving, and this is the learning point. If you're the CEO, however, and this is what the CEOs I, I told you, tell you about, it, you get Lean the moment you realize that, sure, you have a few execution things to do, there are some decisions, only you can make, you, you buy and sell companies, you have some big, sometimes you have legal issues, you have these very big decisions you make. But most of the time you spend it on the shop floor working and developing your, what, what Toyota calls our shop floor development system, but, but it's your learning system. Um, 
of course, as we can see also in this graph, that it's a bit difficult for managers because they tend to be caught in the middle and, and sometimes it's hard to position this. But the essential lesson here that I think, um, and, and we all out to Jeff on this, is that um, seeing, seeing the, the, the lean systems as learning system. And that's it for me. That was excellent. I got to say, I'm smiling on a couple things that you said there, which is really good. Um, and, and that was great. Now, those bullet points that you had from small, Art Smalley. Um, uh, well, it's not exactly Art, but, but it's close enough. Yeah, yeah it, you, we could have spent half an hour on each one. I mean, we went through them very quickly, couldn't we? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, have you, have you read the Art's book? No, I haven't, but, you know. You know yeah, I got to get I really recommend it. It's, it's the deepest book on Kaizen. Actually, everybody talks about Kaizen, but, but actually this is a uh, few people actually have, have looked deeply into this and it's an excellent book and it's written with, co-written with the Isao Kato, which is an absolute sensei. So yeah. well worth the trip. Good. Okay, I'm going to open it up to questions from uh, George uh, Barbas from Australia, Tom from the USA, Peter from Belgium, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the group. Go ahead, guys. Michael, it's George Barbas here. How are you? Australia. Wow. I'm from Australia, and I've enjoyed your presentation. Um, unfortunately for us and our company, we do not touch manufacturing at all. So I found it completely fascinating and uh, learned a lot about what you do in your industry. Sorry, Michael. What do you do? Your company? I'm, I'm the CEO of the Lean Thinking Company, but we heavily focus on uh, working with psychologists, corporates. We deal with um, schools, sporting clubs, and we implement lean thinking or the philosophy of the belief system of lean thinking amongst non-manufacturing entities. So pretty much we're organisational psychologists and we focus probably 20% on process improvement and 80% on belief and skills. And as skills rise, we tend to focus on sales. And our approach is a little bit different. We don't use the tools that you're using. And I, I absolutely love the presentation because we live in the same world, but we're breathing different air. So I'd love to talk to you offline yeah. about, uh, about our approach compared to your approach. Get, don't get too in Australia. Well, not reform psychologists talking together is just going to take too long. Yeah, you guys need yeah. a mediator. Um, <laughs> but uh, by the way, George Barvis is doing a uh, presentation in two days on the Lean Thinking Company and what he does and what challenges he's come across. So uh, that'll be great. So we'll see you then, George. Uh, Tom, Peter, did you get any chat questions? Uh, yes. I, I did this, Tom. I had a uh, question come out uh, on a, uh, if Michael could talk a bit about um, some examples of companies transitioning from Taylorism to lean. Sure, I, you know, it's really not, not such a big problem. The day the CEO wakes up and says, I, no more Taylorism. Now we're gonna do lean. But it takes a couple of years, but the company will follow. So uh, the, 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 uh, all the examples I talk about, it, it really brings us back to the previous seminar and, and Jeff's first point in his cycle. It's about the self-development of the CEO, of the executive, and the commitment to self-development. And once you commit to self-development, then you commit to everybody's development in the company. And you can't do this through Taylorism. Because Taylorism is about somebody defines the process and everybody other and the rest of the people execute. Now, I'm not saying we should not define process. I mean, certainly methods or certainly experts define the process in general, but in terms of the execution, their process is never adapted to the reality or situation people face. So you teach people and you get them to get Kaizen to actually perform with that. I like this, so there's a Toyota term in engineering, which is the plus alpha factor. So what make everybody, you know, follows the same processes more or less, and we make the we we cook the same way, you have the same order more or less. But what makes a successful dish 
is that at every step, there is this plus alpha factor. And this you cannot design by your Tellerous way. You have to bring people into it. Now, the interesting thing is, is that if you teach this alpha plus alpha factor to everybody, um, sometimes you, you open up from improvement avenues for innovation you never thought were there. And also, when you come up with a radical innovation, such as a calculator for a hybrid engine, and it doesn't work because it never works the first time, your people are so trained to problem solving that they know how to make it work. So improvement leads you, and we'll talk about it in a future seminar, webinar, improvement leads you into true innovation. That's excellent. Uh, Peter DePorter, Belgium, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, hi Michael, I have a question. Uh, it's all about development of people. Do you have a certain process you use for the development of the skills of your people? Because there is so much to learn. You have to learn about uh, how to coach, you have to learn about problem solving and all the rest, but you cannot learn it uh, all at once. Do you have a certain development process Sure. you use in your company? Sure. Um, it, basically, uh, it's mostly the, the, the it's mostly this. Basically, the whole thing is to work within work. So it's mostly about the dojo. Uh, we have to, first first you need the pool system in place, and then you do these dojos, which is like everybody uh, an operator a typical operator will work in two development ways. One, they work normally during the day. They write down the obstacles they meet, and then they will have 20 minutes every, I don't know, a couple of weeks that their supervisor spends with them to go into details of a standard. They will also have a daily uh, set of meeting, a really five minutes that, that really uh, tells them what, you know, briefs them on how the previous shift went, and if they have something to check to make sure this, to pay attention that this shift goes well. So this is very light but it is ongoing, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. Then the other thing is that the, these, these operators here will have is that um, they will, some of them will be part of a quality circle in which we will te teach them the improvement skills. So we actually don't, don't drown them at all in, in, in tools and things like that, not at all. The development process is that you do the work uh, following the, the pool system and the production analysis board, then Regularly, you have a one-to-one -one meeting with your supervisor to go in-depth in your understanding of standards, one after the other. And the third thing you do is that you have the you participate in one problem at a time in a quality circle. But does that answer your question? Yes, certainly. Thank you. There's nothing else. I mean, they're really it's it's a plus. Of course, when they have a suggestion, we help them with it. But the, there's really very very little else. Great presentation, Michael. This is Hedia. Um, wonderful. I can't wait to get the slide deck and go over it again. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I've already ordered your book. I just wanted to know if you can repeat the name of the Kaizen book that you mentioned. Uh, Michael, did you hear the question? Hello, Mr. Bolle. Hi, Janneke. Hi, this is Janneke from uh, the Netherlands speaking. Uh, I was wondering about um, the visualization of um, implemented, um, let me see, I wrote it down, uh, the implemented um, improvements by the employees. How important is it um, to visualize uh, the improvements uh, for uh, for the employees themselves, is it important to visualize that? I, I I think that in terms of supporting, I don't know about how important this is. This is what we do. I think I think that it's as a psychologist and um, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. I'd love to have a the the uh, sorry I miss your name, but the, the the opinion from our friend from Australia um, as a psychologist. But I think it's important that that people have ownership of their work areas. 
Mm -hmm. So there's two things we do. We try to visualize them in the work areas. But the other thing we do is we, we choose a, a suggestion per month, which is decorated with a plaque that we put in the, the entrance lobby with a dream that one day the all the corners of the company will be covered in plaques of the suggestion of the month. And we think that it's very important that employees see their contribution to their work area. And a contribution that could maybe for a uh, very important uh, executive could not be very important. It's very important for the employee to part of them. So yeah, we this we we believe that it's very important that when employees come to work, they can say, "You see this this um, this ergonomic improvement that was mighty." The, the other thing I, I really really believe in um, is that there is no everybody says management should listen more. It's it's a it's a motherhood. It's a you know of course management. Well, I don't believe there's such thing as listening. There are only proofs of listening, mm -hmm. and the only way to prove you listen is when you somebody says something. You say, you know what? Go ahead, do it. That's the only proof you have of listening. So every opportunity as a manager, somebody comes up with something and say, you you say, well, what's what is it? And so forth. And you have a suggestion. <laughs> Just do it. Just do what I tell you. <laughs> and 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 this is really this is the only proof of listening you can give. It's it, I'm not saying it's easy. It's very hard. Yeah, you asked, you asked for George's opinion, George Barbas from Australia. What was the opinion for um, Michael? About I believe that it's really important that people see their contribution through their workspace in terms of uh, feeling confident and own and ownership of the, of where they work. I, I don't know. Yeah, what Mark, Michael, I 110% um, I agree with you. I think the, the challenge for us as an organisation, and it may be very similar for the audience, is to try to help people create positive brain habits. And we, for the first five days, we teach people the importance of self-reflection. So they're basically looking down on themselves to understand that they have strengths and weaknesses. And that realisation process is very important. Michael. Daniel Breston, hi. Hey, Daniel. Thank you very much. Middle management. They seem to always want to scupper lean programs, especially in IT. They look at it as fluffy, soft, job-threatening stuff. Suggestions from you, the audience, as to how to get them to see the light? It's 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 hard to have um, opinions in the plural. Um, I really think this is a case by case um, question. One of the things I haven't talked about and that, that fits the topic is one of the very th early things I started with CEOs is we start regular people review all the way down their organizations. And these people review is, is not looking at job descriptions, but looking at autonomy in on Jeff's model which is trying to understand at each level of management what, what problems should people be able to solve on their own and which problems do they uh, need help with. And, and this gets us into very different individuals and different things. And we realize that the, the CEO sometimes uh, reduces the scope of some people so that makes them feel more comfortable and grows the scope of other people. And, and but they're really, no, I do, I don't have any general suggestion other than <laughs> you you have to take it on a case by case basis and try to f understand what what's biting them. Um, um, very often we've been very cruel with middle managers. We we've, we've asked them, we've given them tough objectives with no method whatsoever into how to how to um, how to accomplish them. So so they kind of have a history of this, and uh, sometimes you turn them around, sometimes don't. Okay, thank you. I just want to know, is lean becoming better? Are we becoming better practitioners? Is it becoming more popular? Are we gaining more market respect? Are we actually seen in a better light in your industry? How is the fraternity and the advisory services going over there? Ooh, loaded question. Yeah, good question. And I won't record it if you don't want me to. But you go ahead. I, it's um, 
I'm, I'm currently, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I, I, I'm currently working with uh, Dan Jones and we are, we are evaluating all the robot leaders trying to change the world. And we're looking at it, taking a, a hard look at ourselves and at the lean movement. And um, lean has definitely spread across the world. But okay, let, let, me, let me answer as a psychologist. Do you know in the Piaget's theory that when you have a new thing, well, there's discovery, but then the first instinct with new facts is to assimilate them, which is bring the new fact to what you already believe, so you don't have to change your beliefs. Then some people actually accommodate their beliefs to the new fact, but they will change one belief in order to accommodate the new fact. And sometimes if you do this enough and the fact repeats itself, you get a transformation, which is your entire worldview sort of hinges on the, on, on the new fact, you know, it turns around. So um, uh, my vision of the lean movement for what it's worth is that we have a lot of people around the world assimilating. They, they have all this information about the lean and, the, and they're, um, they're not listening to what is really new and transformational about it, but they bring back lean to lean six sigma and operational expert excellence and static efficiencies. We are very few practitioners to have switched to this understanding that we want a dynamic gain. Now, what is fascinating as well is that a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, Joseph Stiglitz, came up with a book called Creating a Learning Society, in which he repeatedly mentions just in time. So uh, there are, uh, I think we were in this transition uh, generation, which is um, there's uh, 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 many people and still spreading that are assimilating lean ideas back to Taylorist views. But there's also a strong group of people trying to um, understand this constant learning aspect of lean and the fact that improvement is a strategy. Improvement of the product and service for customers, improvement of how you work with your people, improvement of the partnership with your suppliers. And this constant improvement is what delivers the innovation we need in today's world of changing platforms. So I think the movement is very interesting because I, I don't know if we're getting better practitioners, but I can see those those two tendencies are, those two streams are happening at the same time. And I have absolutely no idea where this is going. But uh, I think that as uh, somebody like me who's been, you know, committed to this thing for 20 years, um, and this is Dan, and we have this responsibility to be clearer on where we think lean is um, radical and transformative and when lean brings us to innovative companies and not accept lean as some, some sort of operational excellence, just keep everything static and make it work as best as it can and get the most out of it. Do, does that answer? I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but. Oh, well, no, no, you've answered the question. Thank you. Uh, my, obviously my company's called the lean thinking company. So you're always concerned about the brand, you know, and where it's going, but Unfortunately, whether we like it or not, as practitioners, we have to get better and faster and we have to provide better value to our clients because we live in a world of 140 characters with an attention span of potentially 20 seconds. And uh, in our business, we provide payback within literally 30, 40 days or CEOs are just not interested. To, so to, we have to be very fast. To be honest, George, here, here's a thing. Here's an interesting thing. How, how many consultants do you know that apply this to themselves? There are many who would not be able to evidence continuous improvement or personal investment. And um, that's, that's obviously something you and I will talk about offline. But ultimately, here we have as practitioners of change and leaders of change, we have a really wonderful opportunity ahead of us because our customers' mindset has changed dramatically. They want better and faster results. And that only forces us as practitioners to look inside and to actually get better ourselves 
And I love the market tension. I love that side of things, which just forces us to become better companies. So um, I look forward to having a chat to you offline, Michael. I think you and I have got a lot in common. This is uh, Jim Mikulski. How are you? <laughs> Uh, great uh, webinar, and uh, your your last conversation there with George uh, sparked some interest. But as I was as a practitioner for probably about a decade or more of lean and and or six sigma, I've noticed the movement in recent years, at least in in recent time, moving more towards organizational development. And I, what sparked to me as I hear the the conversations about your background and and I've got your your latest book, um, uh, you know, leading with respect. And reading more about that concept, I see that convergence. And I guess my question is, is that the evolution that you're seeing across the industry as well in terms of the of, of where we're going? It, it is about developing organizational capability. It's not just about the uh, the, the, the return on investment in, in hard terms, as, as you describe in Taylorism. You know... <laughs> Um, here, here, here's what I do. Here's what I do. I, here's what I do with seals. Um, we take the cash out of the inventory. We reinvest it into products. So we try to sell more. This is the story of the team today, and this is good because when you take off cash in the inventory and you make everything work better, you liberate a lot of capacity, and you want to keep people working, so you need more. So. This is this is this is where the this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, I, I'm not so sure about everything. Is about uh, just uh, techniques to learn how to do this. And what I find is very ironic is that when I was first interested in lean, you know, we're talking 20 years ago now, it was all about the you know, flow. It was all about accelerating the flow. Then I was one of the guys who uh, was part of the movement and, and with Dan Jones support and we introduced this idea of uh, problem solving, which had been there from the start of Toyota, but we were not looking at it. So now suddenly everybody talks about organizational development and problem solving. <laughs> but it's both. It's both. You, you can't have um, a smart problem solving without a pull system and without flow. And, and, and the trick is understanding the, 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 the tension between the long-term challenges, improving quality, improving safety, improving uh, flexibility, improving productivity, and the the, the very local kaizen, um, you know, getting teams together to grow and develop together. So there, there, there's a trick to this. There's um, a gesture here. On the one hand, you need to teach CEOs where's the potential, and you have all this inventory because you're inflexible, <laughs> and you just have to fix this because you need to teach people how to be more flexible with the machines they have. And on the other hand, this will teach people to do new stuff they've not thought about. And this is where it all comes together is, again, back to they learn, you learn, but the tools are essential. It's all about the lean tools. It's all about the Kaizen practice. So. It, it, to me, it's very strange because we, I, I, was grow, I grew up in a very mechanistic view of lean. And I was one of the, I, I, we were several, but one of the guys who introduced a more humanistic view of lean. And now people are running away with this and they say lean is only problem solving or learning. And say, hey guys, hey, we're like, yeah, sure. But uh, we need to know what to learn before we learn. And in order to know what to learn, we have to go back to the tools and, uh, and understand the goals and, and giving clear methods for people to solve their own problems. So, uh, <laughs> tricky. <laughs> okay, I think what's clear is lean the word has outlasted far beyond what I thought it would. Like I, I was in just in time, the just in time world, and I was teaching Apex training and they had a just in time module. And it was part of ERP, and from just in time, it turned into lean. And before that, it was total quality management. But lean has definitely, as a word, outlasted, you know, probably five, ten years from what I thought it would. Yeah, well, uh, the, one, the, uh, the clever thing about lean is that, uh, as I understand it, it translates in no other language. So uh, when they coined it lean, they, you know, they, um, 
I think yeah, John Krafschik, I think, are basically the original gang. They when they decided to go for it, they originally wanted to call it fragile because when something's wrong, it stops. But it probably wouldn't have sold so well. So when they called it lean, they just created an instant franchise just because nobody else could translate the word. So that's why we have a hard time registering companies in the US under lean. <laughs> Okay, so any other questions, and then we'll say thank you to Michael. Any other questions? Last uh, five seconds now. Five seconds. Well done, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, everybody, thank you. Say thank you. You can take yourself off mute. Thank you, Michael. If you have any emails, email them to me, but for Michael, and I'll forward them to Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Convening, I think, in a month or so to to, to go to the to go. Basically, we, the, the next session will be put into this Kaizen thing that we discussed today that seemed to interest people. Yeah, absolutely. One more session. Well, two more sessions in the next uh, two months, and we'll send you emails. And everybody here will be registered for the next one. They don't have to do any work. Very good. Okay. Take it easy. Thank you, Michael. Go ahead, guys. Say thank you, and then uh, you can leave if you like. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael.